odd outcomes, economic outcomes, I'd say, from this pandemic has been the the four to five million people that just left the U.S. workforce. I, I really don't have a great idea who they are, where they went, because all I know is I'm riding a train in every day. Matt the great are, resignation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, but I do know as we listen to company after company in the industry at after industry, how difficult it is to attract uh, and retain key talent in this uh, marketplace. So let's get a, a handle on that. We can do that with Shannon Gabriel, Managing Director of Leadership Solutions at TBM Consulting Group. Uh, Shannon, it just seems like so many industries, so many companies are really having a tough time attracting and retaining talent. How do you think about that issue, uh, given what's happened uh, in the last couple of years? Uh, good morning. I... You know, I, the couple different things that I think are happening behind the scenes that companies haven't thought about, it is more than wages. Wages was the initial thing that everyone jumped into quickly, did a wage analysis, they improved it, they became more competitive, but now it's a matter of the culture, and it's a matter of having the right hiring strategy, hiring the right talent that fits your culture, and integrating them into it completely, and that's where one of the misses is, is, uh, is the hiring strategy on the front end of the process. So I was talking to a VC um, yesterday and asking him about the recent job cut announcements. We've gotten some of them were head fakes like Tesla said it was going to cut or Elon Musk said Tesla was going to cut 10 percent of its headcount. And then he came back a day later, oddly said that they're going to grow headcount. But we've heard also that Gemini is cutting 10 percent, a number of others. And he said this isn't because they, they have to. It's because they can. They can use the economy as cover to just get rid of the bottom 10% of their performers, which any company probably wants to do anyway. Do you agree? I do. I do. And if you look back historically, you see a lot of organizations that go through that right-sizing process of realizing that we're holding on to labor that is not bringing the results that we need. And so they'll go through that 10% reduction, and then you'll see them start slowly picking that back up. And it could also be developing a strategy behind, you know, where do we have dead weight versus where we need to have additional arm muscle and horsepower to push things forward so we get the right results in this economy while we can. So, Shannon, you know, I come from an industry, that being Wall Street, where it was all about the money and only about the money. And if I could get another dollar across the street, guess what? I'd go across the street. Um, but hmm. today, the kids want different things. What are some of the key drivers for attracting and retaining talent? I think you have to think about the different layers within the organizational chart and the level of experience that you're bringing them in. You know, your, your younger generation is going to have a stronger desire to have more flexibility. They want to work remote. They want to have a gym if they have to go into the office, and they want, you know, personal daycare that they can rely on. They want all the benefits. Ugh, so and, luxurious. <laughs> Imagine if there were a daycare at work. That's like a fantasy land. I, it is. I would love that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you're, you know, you're, Middle-aged generation are looking for stability. They want more put into the 401k. Uh, they, they're not looking to climb up the corporate ladder as your, young, your younger generation is. They want an entirely different process. So how do you, you know, work within those realms to make sure you're attracting to a broader mass? You have to really be strategic and creative. And But you still have to pay them, right, before. Shannon? Because we still you see still uh, increases in pay. You still have to pay them, and that will bring them in the door, but that's not going to keep them. So if that's the only strategy that a company has is to improve the compensation structure, it's only the first step. Everything else falls apart once they're on site because they realize that it's not worth the money. So if they're working 80 hours a week and they can go somewhere else and do it for make the same for less hours, they're going to take that opportunity. If it's a broken culture and it's you know a, a breakdown within the leadership ranks and the style within that, they're going to leave for less money or the same somewhere else. That's got to be one of the key differences, company. right, Paul? Because when... When you and I were getting into this business, working 80 hours a week was something that you wanted to do. It was like a, it was like an a issue right of, of pride, right? right of if, if you could kill yourself working, you would do that. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. But we had camaraderie. Now with the remote work, I don't have the 80 other kids in the Payne Weber investment banking analyst class uh, in New York City to rely on. Um, so talk to us about that remote work here. Is it here to say this is whole hybrid thing? Yeah, is it healthy? How do you kind of view that? I think it's here to stay. 
I think that we'll see a couple breaks within it um, if we see us going into recession and people start laying more companies start laying off consistently. I think that they'll be it'll require candidates to be more flexible and what they're willing and not willing to do right now, you know, employees own the market, I think that it will stay within a lot of the larger organizations. I don't think unless you are Elon Musk, you're going to be able to hammer down and require everyone to come back in on Monday or you're effectively resigned. So I I think it's going to be here to stay for quite some time. I I think that as this younger generation um, works within, stays within the workforce, I think they're going to require it because that's all they know. What about the manufacturing? uh, What about the plant floor? You bring up Tesla again, and that reminds me, they can't work from home. What do you do about them? So that's one of the big frustrations that we've seen with a lot of the companies that we've worked with. The, you know, you've got, you require employees to come in and work the shop floor. They worked through the pandemic side by side with masks, without masks. And then you have corporate offices that were remote and they ended up not having meetings on Friday. Um, so they started getting all of the perks, and that disconnect yep. between the shop floor and the top floor created a complete breakdown in morale and culture. It w- and, and they're still dealing with it. I've referred to it as the COVID curtain, and, and we still hide behind that pandemic and, and refuse to engage. A lot of companies don't want to re-engage yep. with those employees, and they have to. So in some sense, it's smart that Elon Musk brought these employees, these right. leaders back to say, you've got to engage with the shop floor because they're the ones that are driving the results yep. and the numbers. And you can't do this calling in on right. a Teams meeting I, and I be agree. able to be influential. Yep, I agree. But, you know, I'm in my minority. Shining Gabriel, Managing Director of Leadership Solutions, TBM Consulting.